So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. For those of you who don't know me or haven't attended one of our um, meetings, our, our events before, my name is Caitlin Pena. I'm the Director of Operations and Programs for the Center for Election Science. Um, if you're new to the Center for Election Science, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit that advocates for better voting methods um, to empower voters. And the main voting method that we advocate for is called approval voting. And so if you haven't heard about approval voting, approval voting allows you to vote for as many candidates as you like votes are tallied up and the candidate with the most votes wins. It's that simple. You're not forced to vote for just one candidate. You don't have to rank them, nothing like that. You just you just vote for the candidates you like. Um, and so we've helped uh, activists in Fargo, North Dakota and um, St. Louis, Missouri get approval voting implemented for their city elections. And we're trying to um, help even more uh, citizens across the country who want better elections in their cities. Um, so if you want to learn more about that, you can go to our website. Um, but tonight we are here to talk about the national popular vote, the movement around, uh, around that and around the interstate compact. Um, so I'm very excited to have Eileen here with us. Um, and I'll give her a chance to introduce herself in a moment. Um, but before I do that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Eileen and I will have, I have some questions prepared. So we'll probably talk for about 30 or 40 minutes. Um, and then I will turn it over to all of you um, so that you can ask your questions and get them answered by Eileen. Um, so feel free as, as she and I are talking to put your questions in the chat. Um, and if you can remember, try to put question in all caps at the beginning of your question, just it makes it easier if there's lots of chats going on to be able to see those questions come through. Um, but with, without further ado, I am going to introduce Eileen Reavy to you. She serves as the National Grassroots Director for National Popular Vote. She works on building momentum and support for this issue nationwide and on training volunteers to be organizers and informed advocates for the cause. Eileen is based in Portland, Oregon, and she's traveled to 13 states on behalf of National Popular Vote. So she's she's done a lot of lake work. Um, very nice to have you here, Eileen. Yeah, thank you for having me, Caitlin. I look forward to chatting with you and everyone that's on. Thanks for joining. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just, just to start us off, can you tell us a little bit first about your organization, National Popular Vote? What, what does the work that you all do look like as far as advancing this movement? Yeah, so we advocate for the National Popular Vote Compact, which is a state based reform of the Electoral College. So we're not working, working on abolishing the Electoral College, we're working on getting to a national popular vote in a way that we can have it by this decade, if not by the next election. And so just kind of an overview of, of what that bill actually is. So the National Popular Vote Compact works by states agree to join the compact by passing a state law. And the law says that they'll award their electoral votes to the winner of the national popular vote. But that bill only goes into effect in those states when collectively states with a majority of the electoral votes, so 270 or more, have signed on to this compact. And so when that happens, you have enough electoral votes to win the presidency. And so if you have a majority of the electoral votes committed to the national popular vote winner, well, then you've guaranteed the, that the electoral college winner will be the national popular vote winner. And so it's a way to get one person, one vote through the electoral college. Um, our organization has been around for about 15 years, and this is the sole thing that we focus on. Um, and we've been the one driving the lobbying and advocacy for it during that time. Awesome. That, that's super helpful to have that uh, explanation. That was going to be my next question for you, um, just in case there was anybody out there who didn't know what, what we'll call it the NPVIC um, for short, uh, what that entailed. So why do you and the organization National Popular Vote feel that um, the interstate compact is needed and what problems do you think it solves? Yeah. I think the way that we elect the president now is broken. Five of our 46 presidents have come into office without having originally won the most votes. On top of that, which I mean, that alone should be glaring enough, right? That 10% of our presidents didn't even have the most amount of voters behind them. Um, but 
the way that it really affects our campaigning is really significant. So for, because 48 states uh, and DC use winner take all laws for awarding their electoral votes. So that means that whoever gets the most votes in their state on election day gets all of their electoral votes. As a result, most of the country is completely ignored in the general election for the US president because we already know how California is going to vote. We already know how Maryland's going to vote. We know how North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming are going to vote. And so the entire general election campaign occurs in about a dozen swing states. If you look at the last uh, several presidential elections, virtually all of our campaign events occurred in just 12 states. And so that leaves most of the country ignored and most of our voters not being a part of it. And as if that wasn't bad enough that, you know, every vote is not equal and people's voices aren't really being heard, it goes beyond campaigning. It affects that swing states get more federal funding, they get more disaster declarations, they have a bigger role in shaping federal policy. It's, it's shaped around them, right? That's why we heard about fracking in the presidential and vice presidential debate and no one mentioned the wildfires that were affecting states that one in five Americans lived in. So it has these really big implications that we don't even think of all of the time and affects a lot of our society and I think we have to fix it. Yeah, and that's that's so interesting because um, you, you know I hear you saying so many Americans are being ignored, um, their votes essentially are, the candidates don't care about them because they know they really don't matter in the end. Um, but then lots of times you hear arguments um, from folks who want to keep the electoral college who say, if we get rid of the electoral college, these particular states or these particular cities will have all of the say and they'll be able to determine the outcomes of our election. So what, how do you feel about that? What's your response there? Yeah, I think that that's one of those kind of really big misconceptions that hangs out there, uh, really about where the population in America lives. Um, if you look at the 100 largest cities in America, so number 100 on that list is Spokane, Washington, 208,000 people. That is not exactly a liberal metropolis either, because that's what a lot of people think, is that cities are going to control the election and we're only going to have Democrats. So 100 largest cities in America, they only make up 19% of the US population. Wow. Yeah. And it just so happens that 19% of Americans is also the same number of people that live in rural America, as defined by the US Census. So you've got 19% of voters in the 100 biggest cities, 19% of people in rural America, and 62% of the country in between, which mm -hmm. is in the suburbs where people are evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans. So overall, I mean, there's like several myths in there about people thinking how it's going to work, but people just really should look at the numbers and think about it, that we know that people live all over the country. We know that we don't have 400 of our 435 members of Congress are not just in California and New York, right? People are, our representatives are all, are spread out throughout the country because that's our population is everywhere. And so we're not just gonna have candidates going to one state or a handful of states. That's what happens now, uh, but we're not gonna have that with a national popular vote. Gotcha. So as far as um, your organization, National Popular Vote and the Interstate Compact, what progress have you all made so far? Yep. So, so far, 15 states and DC, because DC has electoral votes, even though they don't have representation in Congress, um, have signed on to the compact. And so collectively, we have 195 electoral votes. And that's using the, the brand new numbers from the Census Bureau. We have 195 electoral votes. Mm -hmm. So when states with 75 more electoral votes sign on to the compact, then we'll have enough to change the outcome of the presidency and make it so that the national popular vote winner wins. So we're over 70% of the way there towards making this happen. And this is something that we can do in the next few years. So yeah, that was actually going to be my next question. Are there any kind of anticipated wins coming up any or anything that you're specifically working on right now, like particular states that you're working hard in or you're getting close? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll start with looking backwards a little bit that um, in 2019, we passed 
the highest number of states that we've ever had passed in a single legislative session. Um, we had four states join in 2019, and that was kind of the culmination of a lot of, of work and progress. So this year in 2021, um, we haven't had any legislative victories yet, unfortunately, um, but we've been doing a, a lot of ground game of building up organizational support in these states. Um, we've had committee hearings. We've got a committee hearing coming up actually in Maine on Tuesday of next week. Um, so we're seeing progress in some of those states, um, but as far as enactments, we don't have one that's right on the horizon, um, but we are optimistic that that if it doesn't happen this year, we'll see a lot of advancement in 2023. Um, Cause an important thing to think about is that because of the new census numbers, we're gonna have new elections in the state legislatures in almost all of the states that we're working in. Um, so we, we'll hope see maybe some different composition of, the, of those chambers. Yeah, those uh, the, the census numbers are really going to have some ripple effects across across the country. So it'll be interesting to see how that might um, affect what goes on with the interstate compact. And so as uh, when, when exactly did the this project kind of start and how is the the progress gone? Like, have you did, have um, I guess what's what what has been the um, the rate at which you've been kind of acquiring states, if you want to put it that way? Yeah. So we started in two thousand and six, um, and the first state that passed was in two thousand seven. Um, it was championed by a freshman legislator at the time, who is now Congressman Jamie Raskin. Um, made it his his one issue that he really wanted to work on, and, and was got Maryland to be the first state to join. Um, and it's been steady progress since then over the last 15 years. Um, if you look at it in terms of when states have passed, we have had lulls. We have had a couple of years where we didn't have uh, any states joined. And then we've also had spurts where, you know, in uh, 2018, we had Connecticut join. And then in 2019, we had uh, four more states join. If you look at it in terms of electoral votes, it's a little bit harder to look at it that way because, you know, we can have steady progress. We can get Delaware that has three, but we can get California and New York. And we, we saw those numbers obviously jump when we've added those larger states. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it seems like you're making pretty, pretty even progress there. Um, what has been, what have been the challenges that have been coming up with this? Um, any, anything in particular that's just kind of causing barriers or, you know, major questions that people ask those sorts of things? Yeah. So number one, I would say if we just look at legislators, so the people that actually have the power to vote on this bill in states, honestly, it's just inertia. Um, they oftentimes, they, there's just this feeling that they don't want to change the system, that they, they don't want to mess with it, which is funny when you really think about it, because it's their constitutional duty to consider it. It's not, oh, well, we'll leave all this stuff up to the states. It is explicitly left up to the states in the Constitution to make this decision on behalf of the people. Um, and a lot of them think, oh, well, the founders set it up this way, so it's it, we should just stick with that. But they don't actually look a little bit deeper sometimes and realize that, nope, the founders didn't come up with the winner-take-all laws. The winner-take-all laws were not debated at the Constitutional Convention. There were no votes taken on it because they hadn't been thought of. In the first presidential election, three states used winner-take-all, and they all repealed it by the next election. Mm -hmm. So the idea that our current system is what the design that the founders came up with is just incorrect. But really breaking through with that to people can be a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, because I think a lot of people think that they know something about the Electoral College or about you know where our population is or, or what the college is supposed to be doing. Um, but understandably, haven't really dug into it. I haven't had a reason to, or, or honestly, maybe what they were taught in school is incorrect. And so you're working against some of those misconceptions that people have. Um, so I, I think that one is a big one, kind of that like folk civics, civics category, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we get that a lot, even just um, trying to advance approval voting. Lots of times people think that it's unconstitutional for some reason, even though there's nothing in the in the Constitution that prohibits approval voting or ranked choice voting or any other alternative voting method. Um, states have adopted some of these. Uh, so we know that it's, it's not unconstitutional. Um, but there's kind of this idea that if it's not explicit or if it's, it's not the way we did it, 
from you know 1776, then um, it it must not be what we should be doing. Um, and I think it's always it's always good to evaluate uh, our our systems and our processes, and we we know more. You know, we we can keep learning and keep refining things until we strive towards that more perfect union. Right? That's that's what it's all about. Exactly. Um, and so, yeah, you, you were talking about the, um, the constitutionality, and that's actually another thing that I was going to ask you about, um, which is that I have heard some critics say, well, the interstate compact might not be constitutional because the constitution prohibits compacts among states. And so that's kind of a question of if it goes into place, will it, is it going to go to the Supreme Court? What's going to happen? So how do you all feel about that? Yeah. So. I'm going to reframe that a little bit um, because the Constitution does allow for compacts between states. Um, specifically, what it does say, and I'm going to give an abbreviated version of the quote from the Constitution here, um, is that no state shall, without the consent of Congress, enter into agreements or compacts with another state. And so it's really around the congressional consent is the argument that we hear most from critics um, that the lack of consent from Congress it means that the compact is invalid. And so as a response to that, um, you know, our opinion at National Popular Vote is, is looking at the interpretation of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has over 100 years of case law where they say that interstate compacts that encroach upon or interfere with the just supremacy of the United States, those are the ones that need uh, congressional consent. And everything else they have said don't doesn't need congressional consent. Um, so compacts that uh, are, you know, deal with water law, you know, commerce, if it's the international migratory bird tree, like things like that that involve federal powers, that needs congressional consent. Mm -hmm. But if you're passing an interstate compact to deal with exchanging information on sex offenders, a very common one in the US, that is an example of compacts that don't need congressional consent. So because the awarding of electoral votes is explicitly left up to the states and the constitution, we believe that that's a, a, a federal and plenary plow, power, excuse me. Um, and so we don't think that this will need congressional consent. The most recent ruling on this, kind of relating to this generally, is actually only from 2020, um, from June of 2020. And so that was an 8-0 decision affirming wow. the power, uh, that it's an absolute power of the states uh, to decide what the, how they want to award their electoral votes. So even with the current composition of the court, we feel confident about that we won't need consent. All of that being said, uh, this is America, it's a litigious society. We sure. know we're gonna end up in front of the Supreme Court before we change the way America elects the president. Um, if they overturn a hundred years of Supreme Court president and say, we need to get consent, that's okay. We will then go and lobby Congress the same way that we've lobbied every single state legislature in the country on this issue. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you all are prepared for every eventuality um, and you're probably stocking up on on, law, <laughs> on lawyers uh, with with this stuff. Like you said, we're definitely lit litigious here in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, we we try. I mean, when this um, compact was created, I mean, it was an idea that was put in a law review article somewhere that someone kind of came up with, and it, it mm -hmm. sat out there for a little bit before anyone did anything with it. But it was our organization um, and the chairman and, and founder of our organization, Dr. John Koza, who pulled together a team of the, some of the finest lawyers in the country at the time and said, how do we really craft this bill in a way that's uh, going to work exactly the way that we want. Um, and so there was a lot of work that went into compiling the 888 words of the compact back when at the founding of the organization. Yeah, I, I'm sure that, I, I mean, even just putting together um, a, a ballot initiative language, you know, we have a little bit of experience with that takes a lot of time and effort. And so something like this that affects the entire US and that you know is going to be a little bit controversial for some folks, right? Um, I'm sure you put in lots and lots of uh, time and effort there. Um, and so I've, I've just got a couple more questions and then I'm going to toss it over to the chat. So get your questions in there, everybody, just as a reminder. Um, 
And so this is something that I think a lot of folks on the call will be interested in hearing more about. We might have some more, more specific questions uh, from people in the chat as well. But as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing more and more cities and states adopting alternative voting methods like ranked choice voting, approval voting, um, even uh, other voting methods like star voting are starting to come up as well. So how does the interstate compact account for those alternative voting methods? And you know, is it going to be possible for a single national uh, vote to be tabulated if different um, states are using different methods? Uh, is that something that you all have thought much about? Yeah, um, so it is possible if states are using different ways of calculating their vote to come up with a national popular vote. Um, I think what is the duty of the state legislature is that if they decide that they want to use approval voting or ranked choice voting or some other method for awarding electoral votes, when they pass that law, they need to think about, OK, how will this be calculated with a national popular vote, assuming it goes into effect? Um, you know, it's I think it's especially within state legislatures, it's out there enough that this is something that could happen. Um, and so that that should be on their radar. Um, you know, we're having those conversations in Maine right now. Maine, of course, uses ranked choice mm -hmm. voting for awarding their electoral votes. Um, and we want Maine to join the National Popular Vote Compact. And so uh, looking at making sure that when they pass that legislation, they say, OK, what is this going to look like? How is this going to be calculated? Um, and then on the flip side, it's for states that are passing the compact is, is understanding that that's a part of what they're signing up for, is that those states still preserve that power to decide how they want their vote counted. Um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we get some additional questions about this um, in the chat. We'll see. I, I am not the super technical voting methods person. I know enough from working at this work at this organization and being able to talk about it. Um, but I know there are some some people in the chat who probably have even more specific questions than what I have. So I'll, I'll leave that up to them. Um, but it's good to know that you all are thinking about that. It's something that you're aware of, especially, you know, with Maine, you're currently working with Maine, you know that that's something that um, that's going to be an issue for them. Um, so it's it's good to hear that it's on its top of mind. Yeah, and one other thing I should add to that. Um, so when we this we being national popular vote was long before I worked for the organization. Um, when they were crafting the bill, one of the people that worked on that and is one of the co-authors of our book, Every Vote Equal, um, is Rob Ritchie from Fair Vote. So mm -hmm. it was at the beginning something that we thought of. It wasn't an afterthought. It was how do we make sure that this bill allows for this in the future? but also without explicitly naming any other alternative voting method, because then that leaves room for whatever comes up in the future to work within the bill. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that as well, because, yeah, we, we see that there's lots of <laughs> there's lots of new methods coming coming around. Um, and so uh, my last question uh, before we go to the chat is just if, if folks are interested and getting involved in trying to make this happen in their state um, or just helping you in general, what, what can they do? Yeah, so signing up, if you go to nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer, um, you'll get linked in with me and I can let you know what's going on in your specific state. If we've got a grassroots campaign going, if we've got people that are meeting that we can connect you with, um, or if you're in a state that's already passed it, or if you're in a state where you're saying, you know, there's no way this is ever going to pass in my particular state, um, you can still help us by helping, you know, work phone banks when we're doing big legislative pushes and, and volunteering that way to help mobilize people across the country. And also, honestly, just talking to your friends and family about this, especially as people who really care uh, about election reform. Uh, you know, I'm guessing since you're participants with the Center for Election Science, just talking to people and letting them know that this reform is out there. Because a lot of people think, oh, we can't change the way we elect the president. Like we mm -hmm. can do all these other things, but that's that's too far. Right. Uh, or they just, they don't know about the mechanism of the national popular vote bill. And so getting the word out there about that can be really helpful because no, we don't have to abolish the electoral college. We don't have to go through a constitutional amendment. We can reform it for the betterment of America through state-by-state -state action. And we can do that in the next couple of years. Awesome. Um, 
Okay, so I did actually get some questions ahead of time. Um, so I'm uh, while I let some additional folks get, get their questions into the chat, I have one here from Brian Shank. Um, and it's a little bit long, but I think each each piece is necessary. So um, slow me down if, if I go too fast. So Brian asks, does the plenary and, ex and exclusive power to choose electors belong to the state or to the state legislature? If it is determined by the Supreme Court to belong to the legislatures, then is the six month blackout period of the of the interstate compact unconstitutional or unenforceable? How can any newly elected legislature dissatisfied with a popular vote be prevented from dropping out of the compact in the middle of a presidential campaign? Um, did that, did you get all of that? <laughs> Yes, um, you're gonna have to help make me help me make sure I answer all of those points, though. Sure. Um, so the for, I think the first part of it was around um, the state legislature versus the state. So mm -hmm. Article Two, Section One of the U.S. Constitution says each state shall appoint in such manner as the legislature thereof may direct a number of electors. Um, so the, the power to award electors is up to the state legislature. Um, it is in a question that kind of hangs out there on particularly within article two of the constitution, if the meaning of the word legislature means the actual body of people that meet near state capital, or if that can also mean the people through a ballot initiative. Mm -hmm. Um, currently, uh, from the Arizona redistricting case, the, the current Supreme Court ruling is that that does extend to the legislature, um, or excuse me, to the uh, a ballot initiative. Um, but it's, it's kind of one of those undecided things on uh, if that will continue to be the case because it's a little bit of a more uh, a cl more closely divided issue. Um, as far as the blackout period, so I'm just going to explain that first. So um, it's in the language of our bill that a state cannot withdraw from the interstate compact between July 20th of an election year and six months later, inauguration day. Um, the purpose for that is to prevent a state from gaming the system. You don't want California to be a part of the compact and to say, oh, OK, looks like the Republicans going to win the national popular vote. Uh, we're out. It's October. Right. We're throwing the election up in the air. Uh, no, that cannot happen um, because of that, uh, uh, because of the language in our compact. The binding part of that, though, that holds the state legislature to that is not the, the language of the compact itself, but it's actually the um, compacts clause or the, in the Constitution. So no state in the history of the Republic has ever left an interstate compact without adhering to the terms of that compact. So, you know, the question is like, well, if it's an absolute power of the states, does that override the agreement that the states are in? And mm -hmm. the answer is no, because it's in the constitution of how these interstate compacts are regulated, that they, the states, when they enter into it, they know that they have to adhere to the terms of withdrawal. Um, and then I think that was maybe only two parts of the question. So can you remind yeah. me of the final part? Yeah, so, the, so the last part was, how can any newly elected legislature dissatisfied with a popular vote be prevented from dropping out of the compact in the middle of a presidential campaign? And so that I, I think that kind of follows with what, what you were just saying about the blackout period, correct? Yeah. Um, and then the only thing I think I'll add, uh, a question we've gotten more, especially since January 6th, is concern about state legislatures trying to withdraw afterwards um, or mm -hmm. trying to say, not even trying to withdraw, but trying to say, nope, we're going to just appoint a different slate of electors entirely. Right. Um, and the, the thing to know about that is that there is only one day that electors are chosen. Um, that comes from the language of the Constitution, um, that electors are chosen on a single day that is set by Congress. So they can't, the state legislature cannot federally, after the election, try and say, oh, well, we're going to change our law and really we're going to do that. They, there's just multiple reasons why that can't happen. Um, but that's a, a great question from that individual. <laughs> Yes, he clearly knows what knows his stuff. I, I, I know Brian, he, he definitely knows his stuff. Um, 
Okay, so we've got a question from Martin um, that you probably get pretty often. Can you explain why you aren't trying to just get rid of the Electoral College? Yeah, um, so I, I mean, as an organization, that's that's not wor what we're about. Um, there have been over 800 attempts to change or abolish the Electoral College, more than anything else in our constitution. Only one change has been made. That was the 12th amendment, um, which made a few small changes, uh, the biggest of which being that no longer the second place candidate became the vice president. It gave us the slates of president and VP. Um, so uh, honestly, I think that the task of amending the constitution is a really big one. Um, and that that's one that isn't on the horizon. Um, I really like the National Popular Vote Compact because of the fact that it's something that we can do in the near future. It, this is a huge problem. Um, you know, for Gen Z, they've spent at least 50% of their life with a president who wasn't originally elected by National Popular Vote. For millennials, they've spent at least 30% of their life that way. So you have these massive repercussions, especially for younger generations. I mean, five of our nine Supreme Court justices were uh, awarded, or excuse me, appointed by presidents who didn't originally win the, the national popular vote. So this is a, a really big problem, especially right now. I think that this is the way that we can fix it, um, is through this state power uh, of reforming the Electoral College. Um, and I like the fact that it's something that because of that, we get more people from both sides of the aisle agreeing to work on it. You know, um, I lobbied this bill in Oregon uh, when they passed it in 2019, um, and we had several Republicans vote for the bill that I, I know from my conversations with them, they liked that it was a state reform. They never would have agreed to abolishing the Electoral College. They like this idea of let's try it out first uh, in case there are unintended consequences. I don't think there will be. I think. The entire country is going to be better off once we have a national popular vote, but at least it brings those people along that we can try it out and make sure it's the right fit for the country um, with before we do a big constitutional change. Gotcha. Um, and then Camille asks, is it harder in Republican states? Uh, and I know Camille is watching from Canada, so she's probably curious about the politics of all this. Yeah, that's a great question. So Frankly, yes, since the 2016 election in particular, um, we have seen uh, slower progress in Republican leading states. If you look at the 15 states and DC, um, actually, I'm going to go ahead and just quickly share this graphic so you all get yeah. a sense um, of where uh, has passed it so far. Um, just two seconds here. Um, so if you look at this, where the states that have passed it so far, um, they're mostly democratic leaning states, you know, where I, there's no hiding that fact. Um, and so uh, with that, we have made progress in Republican uh, chambers before. Um, we have passed uh, chambers in Oklahoma and Arkansas. Um, when we passed the New York Senate, uh, they were held by Republicans. So we have um, made progress in Republican chambers overall. Um, but since 2016, that's gotten harder um, because of the perception that the current system benefits Republicans. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to report that we are seeing that shift since the 2020 election. Um, you know, if you look at the 2020 election, Donald Trump came really close to winning. Um, he was less than 22,000 votes away from winning a second term. Um, he only needed those, that, those additional votes in Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin, and he would have won uh, the election. And so if I'm a Republican strategist, I might be looking at that and thinking, yeah, that's not really a stable system for us either. Yeah. Donald Trump won the popular vote in the battleground states in 2016, and he won the popular vote in the battleground states in 2020. He got a million more votes in the battleground states, but he didn't get them in the right states to win. I think people on both sides of the aisle can say, hey, this isn't really a great system for us, and mm -hmm. we should just make it one person, one vote. Um, and also, you know, it's kind of always out there that Texas is getting slightly bluer with every election. 
if Texas flips blue, even for one election, I mean, that's going to make it very difficult for Republicans to get to 270 electoral votes. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of reasons that we're, we're starting to see some people come around on that now that we've had another presidential election behind us. Yeah. And and before I go to another question, um, you have mentioned a couple times about one person, one vote, right? And so just for anybody out there who may not understand what that reference is or how that comes into play with the Electoral College, can you just explain that? Yeah. Um, so under the current system, um, every vote for president is not equal. Um, within, If you're in a battleground state, your vote is extremely important. You get to help decide who the next president of the US is. Um, and if you are anywhere else, your vote is taken for granted. Um, and so when we say one person, one vote, we mean that we think that whether you're in you know, downtown Manhattan or Miami or Juneau, Alaska, you should have an equal opportunity um, to change the outcome of the presidential election. Um, and then I'll just show, and I think that this might share more appropriately size to this time. Um, there we go. So this is um, the where campaign events have occurred just from the most recent three elections. Um, and you see that in you know 2012, 100% of events happened in a dozen states. In 2016 and 2020, those numbers were 94% and 96% respectively. So huge swaths of the country are being completely ignored. Um, and we want their votes to be equal. We want those voters to matter. I mean, I think especially around the 2020 election, you know, we saw higher voter turnout than we ever have, which is fantastic. And people felt like their vote really made a difference. And I hate, I really hate to be the one to say, well, your vote didn't really matter because I don't want anyone in this country to feel that their vote doesn't matter. Right. Um, I want, so that's why we have to make it so that every vote is equal. Um, so that regardless of where you are, you have an equal opportunity to be the one vote that decides the outcome of the election. Awesome. Yeah. Um, we're, we're really focused on, on every voice counting as well, because it happens a lot with our current uh, choose one vote each system that lots of times people's voice voices don't really count. Um, so another good question, um, which is kind of goes back to the basics of the bill is what does consent entail? The, a majority vote, passage of a federal law, like how, I, I think they're asking, how does this go into effect? Um, yeah, so how it goes into effect is being passed by the state legislature. Um, and so the interpretation of that means that both chambers of Congress, or in the one case, one chamber for our one unicameral legislature, um, and the governor has to sign the bill for it to go into effect. So um, it has not so far been passed by a state constitutional amendment anywhere with a, a higher qualification that some states have. It's just a bill like any other bill that a state would pass. Um, so whatever the requirement in that state is for passing it is, is what it is for the national popular vote bill. Um, and then you kind of answered this question um, just now when I was asking about the one person, one vote, uh, but Thomas asks, how do you try to convince people who think the current system is stacked in their favor? Um, you know, for, or, or the, the, the question about the Republican states, like how, how do you convince those folks if they feel like the current system is benefiting them? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it depends a little bit on the state, honestly, what the what the best argument is. Um, but a lot of it just comes down to fairness. Um, if you are currently in a battleground state and you like that, you listen to my presentation and you go, oh, we get more federal grants worth more dollars. That sounds great. Sign me up. Um, the important thing to remember is your state is not always going to be a battleground state. And if you do plan on living there for the rest of your life, you're going to have a time in the future where you're completely out in the cold with the rest of the country. Or wouldn't it be nice to be able to move or have your friends and children or whoever move and have them have an equal voice uh, in selecting the president? It's a very straightforward concept, honestly, just sticking with that message that it should be one person, mm -hmm. one vote candidates should be incentivized to campaign in all 50 states um, and finding you know, the argument that resonates with those individuals. I, I'd say generally though, if you're thinking more about it from the um, aspect of talking to legislators who you, you, know, you know what party they fall in, um, 
you know, trying to use the examples of the fact that it's it's not always going to benefit Republicans, um, even if they think that it is right now. Uh, in 2004, we were less than 60,000 votes away from having President John Kerry. Um, if 60,000 more voters in Ohio had voted for Kerry instead of Bush, we, he would have won the state of Ohio and become the president despite losing the popular vote by a wider margin than Donald Trump did in 2016. And if 60,000 votes sounds like a lot, it's good to remember that 115 million ballots were cast in that election. So it very nearly went the other way and it very nearly could in the future um, as well. And so if you're partisan looking at it from that angle, I, I think that that's a good talking point to use with folks. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something we run into a lot as well. We're a nonpartisan organization. Voting methods themselves are nonpartisan. They don't they don't care about parties. Um, we're just trying to make sure that all voters have their voices heard. But you get that question about, well, you know, things are going right for me or this this voting method. They just want to get this certain party in uh, in power. And that's really not what it's about. Right. Um, we we just want to make sure that every person's voice is heard. Um, so here's here's a good question about about the voting method aspect uh, that I thought might come up. Sarah asks, well, she says summing approval score star and star ballots is fairly straightforward, but how do RCV fans want their votes to be summed with plurality votes to calculate a national popular vote? Um, do you know the specifics of how how they're uh, wanting those calculations to be done? Um, yeah, I mean, what I think we're seeing in Maine um, is a, a, a good model for that, but that's, you know, not necessarily what speaks for every ranked choice voting person across the country, um, but would be looking at the final tally uh, of votes and then using that to be um, the, the numbers for the national popular vote. Uh, the other option that you could do would be essentially just doing first round voting, which would essentially not be using ranked choice voting. Um, so while a state could do that, uh, I think that that would overall be less likely to be used in states where they've already passed ranked choice voting. Gotcha. Um, and so then Jeff asks, both houses of the Nevada legislature passed the NPP. So by the power of the legislature under Article 2, Section 1 of the Constitution, is that not sufficient in itself? Why does the governor need to approve? Yeah, that's a great question um, and one that comes up uh, often, but there's really no interpretation kind of in any federal law where legislature in modern day doesn't include the, the governor. That's just kind of what's been the standard is that if you're going to get a bill passed, you have to have the governor involved. That's how states have set up their government. Um, and so the governor is kind of included in that legislature, even though we think of the two chambers usually when we think of the word legislature. Good to know. Lots of interesting facts about uh, the way our our governments are set up. Um, and so then Sarah came back. She she's got kind of a follow up question about the the ranked choice voting um, tabulation. So she says, so for RCV, would that be narrow narrowing it down to the top two finalists and then dividing electors between those two? Or I I think what what did you mean by you know the the final round of voting? Yeah, so sorry, I was giving that answer for calculating a national popular vote. Um, it would, so uh, whether a state is in the national popular vote compact or not, um, and they want to use ranked choice voting, um, they, when they're setting that up in the future, can say, okay, um, we want it to be calculated with, yes, the, the top two or the top three votes in the final round um, will be used to calculate the national popular vote winner. Um, but I mean, that again would be up to the state legislature to ultimately make that call. Um, but I, I, what I should say is that, you know, the states don't have to participate in national popular vote if they're using ranked choice voting and vice versa. It's more of a matter of recognizing that this is a reform that's on the table. I think it's very likely to happen, you know, in the next 10 years, if not sooner. And so when state legislatures are, um, passing laws for how they're going to award their electoral votes, they should think about how it can interact with the National Popular Vote Compact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then Sohini asked, what are the key target states? So I, I'm sure that you guys, obviously you want every state to come on board. Um, and you 
we might have gone over this earlier, but what are the key target states or are there states that you're currently working on? I know you mentioned Maine. Yeah, um, so uh, as far as states that we're working on, um, number one, there are nine states that have already passed the national popular vote th bill through one chamber in a previous mm. session. And so those nine states have 88 electoral votes. So if we just passed the bill in those states, we'd be there. Um, so a number of those are our target states when we're looking at, you know, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Maine, Nevada, we hope to get passed soon as well. Um, and it, it just depends, honestly, on, on um, how those state chambers look and where we can get support. Um, Michigan is another great example. Uh, we had a bill introduced in 2018 in Michigan which had um, 25 of the 38 senators on the bill, which was 15 Republicans and 10 Democrats. Um, so that's a state where we have a lot of institutional support. Um, so I can kind of maybe put the list of the states where we've already passed um, NPV in the chat and that might be helpful as well. Yeah. Um, but certainly if folks wanna get involved, if you, like I said, when you, if you sign up to volunteer at nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer, um, I'll get back to you with information that's specific for your state on how you can get involved. Cause we do have grassroots supporters um, in all 50 states across the country. Awesome. Um, and Sohini also asked uh, along those lines, if we are an organization interested in partnering on this issue, who can we contact to set up an initial conversation? Would that be you or someone else? Yep, that would be me. Um, and so it, are they on the chat? I can put my email um, in here um, as well. Yeah, go right ahead and do that. Um, and then I can also, in the email when I follow up uh, with the recording tomorrow or Monday, um, I will include your information there too so folks can get in contact. Great. Um, all right, and then I, this is the last question I'm seeing in the chat. I, I'll give you all a final, a final call um, for any questions. Um, this one's not directly related to the national popular vote, but something interesting and still related to elections. So Jerry asked, in your conversations with people around the country, do you find that most people recognize that Biden won the 2020 election and that the vote count was not rigged? Um, you know, I, I'm sure that you hear from I, just as as election organizations, we get all of the things that people are thinking about elections, whether it's related or not. And so I'm sure this is something that has come up in your conversations with folks. Yeah, definitely. Um, so my personal experience, um, I the people I am talking to, yes, they, they do recognize that Joe Biden won the presidency. Um, that being said, um, I work specifically in our grassroots space. Um, and so that's a lot of people that are individuals and organizations also interested in election reform. Um, I don't per in particular do the lobbying. We have a, a lobbying side of our organization that does that. And so I can't speak to if they've had dinner different interactions um, with any legislators in any particular state. Gotcha. All right, well, I'm not seeing any other um, questions here in the chat. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and wrap it up here a little bit early. Um, but I did I did want to call out this uh, quick comment from Sass who said, that's my favorite part of this entire topic. The Electoral College is ironically unconstitutional. <laughs> when you were talking about one person, one vote, you know, everybody, most of us are familiar with the idea of one person, one vote, and we really, um, uh, value that idea as Americans, right? But the way that the electoral college is set up, it gives voters in certain states, it gives their votes more weight. And that's that's not equal. That's not one person, one vote. Um, so it seems like changing the electoral college would actually be the more constitutional thing to do. Um, yeah. But thank you um, so I, much. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, if I can kind of as a closing. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's it's uh a very fundamental principle um the the term of one person one vote came from some of our landmark civil rights cases in the 1960s mm -hmm. um that really established that precedent and right. i think that it's time that we get the way that we elect the president to that um i i certainly think you know i talk to people a lot who do support alternative voting methods um and you know there's often that question of not just how they interact but like well is this enough shouldn't we be jumping forward and using approval voting or ranked choice voting or star for electing mm -hmm. the president? Um, and just to kind of speak to that, I think the thing to keep in mind is 
the fact that this is the only reform and the only election that we're talking about that it deals with the entire country. Um, and so one state doing one thing isn't fixing the systemic issue of how we elect the president. We have to look at it as a big picture. And if you're someone who you're like, I can't believe we're really advocating for a system that's first past the post, like that's not the best we can do, work with us anyway, like give national popular vote a chance and really look at it because we have to fix the system of the way we elect the president now. We have to prevent the fact that someone can get less votes and still come into office and that we've had that happen twice in the last two decades and came less than 60,000 votes from having it happen again twice more. We absolutely as Americans have to reject that and make sure that that cannot happen anymore. And then if you wanna advocate for reform beyond that, great, I'll be a part of that conversation and be happy to sit at the table, but we have to fix this first. Um, and so I just appreciate all of you taking the time to, to have this chat with me tonight. So thank you all. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And I think all of us, you know, we're, we're all working on different reforms. There are so many good, um, good government uh, democracy reforms out there right now for folks to support. Um, and we don't have to be, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. A lot of these voting methods kind of are so that, that it's, it's a little bit different there. If you get one voting method implemented, you're not going to get another, but with things like, um, you know, automatic voter registration or the interstate compact or voting methods or, um, uh, campaign finance reform, there are just so, so much out there that needs to be done. Um, and so we all have to kind of support one another uh, how we can. Um, and so speaking of that, everybody, uh, if, if you're interested in getting involved with National Popular Vote, uh, she mentioned it's nationalpopularvote.com slash volunteer. So I'll put that in the chat again. Um, and if you uh, are enjoying this uh, this event, if you love approval voting and you wanna see more people be able to use it, um, definitely consider donating to the Center for Election Science uh, to support our work with approval voting and um, making these types of events and other activities happen for all of you. So I will go ahead and put uh, that in the chat as well. Always gotta get a little donation plug in there. Um, but thank you everyone so much for coming out for your great questions. And especially thank you to Eileen for uh, taking the time to do this. We really appreciate it and appreciate all of your, your hard work on this. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you, Caitlin. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.